You guys know that U.S. actions in Africa are an almost complete mystery, right? Even back before the Internet, when we had more than three newspapers in the United States that did international reporting, it was hard to get U.S. news consumers to care about what was happening there. Now, almost all of our information about Africa comes directly from the Pentagon. There is a lot of U.S. propaganda related to the Middle East as well, but people there are a lot richer than they are in most of Africa, and they have more power and technology to get conflicting messages out. Also, the large-scale presence of non-elite U.S. soldiers drove and still drives real reporting on Middle Eastern conflicts. Media sources like this one have the data they need to construct a different narrative. None of that is present in Africa. Most U.S. troops there are special forces, which means that their presence can be covered up, completely legally. Even U.S. Congress people don't have a clear idea of what they are up to. I didn't know there was a thousand troops in Niger. What we hear about the U.S. war on terror in Africa is almost exclusively what the U.S. government chooses to tell us. We get partial documentation of the money and weapons that are being sent. Every six months or so, for most of a decade now, The Economist or The Wall Street Journal will run a story saying that jihadism is a big and growing problem in Africa. These stories are mostly based on what the Pentagon or a government Washington, D.C. think tank tells them is going on. For years now, I've been claiming on this channel that radical Islamic terrorism is disappearing. This has been confirmed almost everywhere, except for Africa. Supposedly. According to these articles, there's a brand new jihad breaking out in Africa. But these stories have been nearly identical, talking about this brand new jihad, for almost a decade now. They include almost no on-the-ground reporting, and they always say the same thing. It's not entirely clear to me that the insurgencies they are talking about are really the sort of Islamic terrorism the U.S. or Europe has to worry about. This past December, the Wall Street Journal produced what may be the platonic ideal of a Jihad in Africa article. These articles often include blatant lies that are obvious if you've paid any attention to the region at all. This Wall Street Journal article from December actually includes two lies in the headline. I'm sure the author of this piece didn't write the headline because it's contradicted by the article itself. The West has emphatically not built a firewall against al-Qaeda and Islamic State influence in Africa. The 15 years since the U.S. military's founding of Africa Command have created dramatically weaker North African countries that are mostly losing their battles against insurgents. Insurgency in the Sahel is a forest fire that NATO started by taking out Libya back in 2011. It's a forest fire that we have added fuel to ever since by supporting illegitimate strongmen. Here's a clip uh, from a video I made a couple years back talking about what it is exactly that we did to some of the poorest countries in the world. Sahel means coast in many languages, and according to most sources, in this case it refers to the coast not of a body of water, but of the Sahara Desert. All of these countries have been absolutely devastated by the war in Libya. It's important to remember just how rich Libya is. Abundant oil and gas resources make the country a sort of North African UAE, though Libya obviously has a lot more land than the United Arab Emirates. Before 2011, Libya actually had a higher GDP per capita than poor EU countries like Romania and Bulgaria. Muammar Gaddafi, the guy who ran Libya between 1969 and 2011, was a crazy person. But in his own very weird way, he was committed to African freedom and unity. Even if, say, 80% of his African diplomacy was about self-promotion, he had so much money to play with that the other 20% had a tremendous positive impact. As one example, he was one of the main funders of the founding of the African Union. Because Libya had so much spare money, it became central to the economies of not just Tunisia, but all of the countries of the Sahel as well. Money sent home from migrant work in Libya was a big part of the economy of all Sahel countries. Less positively, Gaddafi also relied on soldiers from the Sahel to shore up his own power in Libya, creating groups of well-paid and well-armed actors. Gaddafi's influence on the politics of the Sahel, especially during the Cold War, could be manipulative and violent. But 
so was French and U.S. influence. Libya under Gaddafi provided an alternative. Love him or hate him, Gaddafi was central to the politics of North Africa for decades. Unfortunately, NATO really hated him, so even though he had spent a decade trying to come back in from the cold, in 2011 we destroyed his government and then we laughed as he was murdered in the streets. By the way, I know I have mentioned this before, but the Obama administration's excuse that we did this to save the city of Benghazi rings especially hollow because the city of Benghazi actually ended up being destroyed by a bombing campaign and a three-year-long siege between 2014 and 2017. It doesn't really make things better that it was carried out by a former CIA operative named Khalifa Haftar rather than Gaddafi. The effects of Gaddafi's killing on the Sahel were both immediate and long-lasting. The financial network that had come to underpin the prosperity of much of North Africa disappeared. Gaddafi's African soldiers dispersed back to their countries and took their weapons with them. Mali was the first to fall. Gaddafi was killed in October 2011, and by January 2012, Mali's north was overrun by insurgents with Libyan weapons. The top half of what had been one of Africa's more stable countries ended up being run by jihadists for a year, as the country as the whole experienced a military coup. A French military intervention pushed the insurgents out of the cities, but French troops are still involved a decade later, and Mali suffered yet another coup last year. Mali might be the most politically damaged of the Sahel country, but every country in the region has felt the malign effects of Gaddafi's fall. Insurgencies that already existed intensified, and new insurgencies cropped up with the personnel and weapons that have been streaming out of Libya for the entire decade. We've seen coups in multiple countries. Perhaps the most malign effect is that the U.S. and French militaries have been given an excuse to dig in in the region, with results that have varied from the merely counterproductive and wasteful to the downright horrific. So yeah, the U.S. built an insurgency forest fire in the Sahel, not a firebreak against it. Let's leave aside for a second the question of how directly linked these insurgencies are to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State beyond branding. Nobody's really been able to demonstrate that connection to my satisfaction so far. What is clear is that the governments that the United States and France have been supporting have been failing, and failing badly, for a decade. As an aside, it's honestly kind of shocking that a lot of this article is based on interviews with inevitable future Secretary of State Victoria Nuland, who longtime viewers will recall from her role helping to start wars in Ukraine for the Obama and Biden administrations. Leaving aside the very dark comedy of Newland's imperial omnipresence, she's not an Africa expert. She's a Europe expert. The United States doesn't even bother to invest in Africa-specific propagandists. Too few journalists are asking real questions to make it worth spending the money. The second lie in this Wall Street Journal headline is that there is anything new here. We have been hearing about the new battle against jihad in Africa since 2015 at the latest. This Wall Street Journal article seems transparently timed to coincide with the White House's reporting requirements. According to the 1973 War Powers Resolution, every six months the president has to report all ongoing fighting to the U.S. Congress. December's report admits to a noteworthy spike in U.S. troop levels in Niger, vaulting over a thousand soldiers. A nearly 50% troop increase is something that people might wonder about. So, the Wall Street Journal has put out this U.S. government press release claiming that our war in Niger is both rational and somehow new. Our war in Niger is neither rational nor new. It's actually kind of odd that the White House even bothers reporting real troop numbers for an African country. As this paragraph from the White House's December letter indicates, presidents usually think it's enough to vaguely mention that we have a presence in an African country. It's only the troop levels in Niger that get a specific headcount. This is the result of an old scandal. Some years back, four U.S. troops died in combat in Niger, and most Congress people were embarrassed to admit they had no idea we had troops there. Those four troops died in 2017. 
six years ago. It's not a new conflict. The U.S. government has been putting out the same information about these countries and their insurgencies for almost a decade now, claiming it's new information every time. And honestly, very few people have even noticed. Every couple of years, somebody will pick up on the fact that U.S. trained and funded militaries are destabilizing the region, publish an article, and then never follow up on the implications. It's just too expensive to pay for reporting in Africa. It is well documented that there are some jihadist militias, like Boko Haram, that do truly evil things. So everybody assumes the U.S. military efforts in the region must be worthwhile and moves on. We know very little about what happens in these countries other than what the U.S. government tells us, and it's been that way for most of a decade. And then, in the fall of 2022, something amazing happened. The New York Times sent Roger Cohen, a highly experienced, highly placed journalist, to a single African country for two and a half weeks. And what's more, he was specifically tasked to investigate outside influence and the ways that it makes the Sahel's wars worse. His scathing report came out on December 24th, and I highly recommend that you all read it. So what Sahel country do you think the New York Times finally decided to devote some real resources to? Was it Nigeria, with 211 million people, a globally important petroleum industry, and the most telegenically horrible jihadist insurgency? Nope. Well then, was it Niger, with 27 million people, growing importance in U.S. and French military plans, and over a thousand U.S. troops? Nope. It was the Central African Republic, home to a mere six million people. See, the thing is, unlike most of the rest of the countries in the region, the main outside player isn't France or the United States. In the Central African Republic, it's Russia. Which means we can finally get some anti-imperial Africa reporting from the New York Times. The article does go overboard a bit on the Russia paranoia, as one would expect. Cohen sort of implies that Russia made human rights violations a bigger thing in the country, but I don't buy it. Back in 2015, long before the Wagner mercenaries and other Russians came on the scene, the Central African Republic famously reacted to a non-jihadist, moderately Islamic insurgency by burning down every mosque in the country. Russia didn't spoil some sort of human rights paradise. But standard Putin panic aside, this is a really useful article. The corruption, over-militarization, and failure that Russia is bringing to the Central African Republic is different in some ways, but is mostly very similar to the havoc that the United States and France have been imposing on the region on a much larger scale for over a decade now. Almost all the critiques the Times applies to Russia apply to the U.S. and France as well. The article begins with a legitimately outrageous fact that Russian diplomats are pressuring the Central African Republic's Supreme Court to extend the president's time in power indefinitely. They want to stick with the strongman they like. This is imperialist, illegal, and atrocious. But if you look north to Chad, France maintained President Idris Deby in power there for three solid decades. When he was killed in 2021 on a battlefront largely created by the Libyan war that France did the most to advocate for in 2011, France supported installing Deby's son in power. This required throwing out Chad's constitution, and France supported that disposal entirely. Imperialist, illegal, and atrocious. Just like Russia, but in a country with three times more people. The New York Times article features a great quote from U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken on how pernicious Russian influence in Africa is. They threaten stability. They undermine good governance. They rob countries of mineral wealth. They violate human rights. Secretary Blinken is very on point with his criticisms of Russian actions in Africa. The problem, of course, is that all of his criticisms apply equally and on a much larger scale to France and the United States. What makes NATO's influence different from Russia's is that it isn't applied to the six million people of the Central African Republic. It's applied to hundreds of millions of people across Africa's poorest region. Even the New York Times reporter's grudging admiration of the Russian presence in the Central African Republic has its echoes in earlier NATO successes. Through the application of money, superior firepower, and brutality, Russia has temporarily managed to impose a level of peace on the Central African Republic that it has as an experience since 2012. The New York Times seems impressed. 
but it shouldn't be. This is exactly how France started out in Mali back in 2013, rolling back an insurgency that had taken over the country to the applause of the Malian government and the Malian people. Nine years later, in August of 2022, uh, France was chased out of the country by a Malian government that had experienced two coups in an 18-month period and was again losing control of the country to an insurgency. A hypermilitarized approach to the Sahel's problems has been failing for 12 years now, and it will continue to fail. In 2021, it got so bad that the UN Secretary General felt the need to lament the epidemic of coups in this African region, reaching levels we haven't seen since the Cold War. Outside militaries know how to temporarily win conflicts, not set up functioning governments. The first step towards success in these countries is to pull all the foreign militaries out. The strong men the outside militaries choose to support inevitably provoke new insurgencies. Russia's presence in the Central African Republic is a menace, and it needs to end. But the U.S. and French presence in the rest of the region is also a menace, and it also needs to end. I believe that the militarized lack of information we get is concealing another issue. What these countries are experiencing are probably not counterterrorism wars. What I suspect they are are wars of national consolidation. Creating a nation is almost always a violent business. The French Revolution is probably the most famous example. We all know about the terror in Paris and the few thousand aristocrats and others who lost their lives to the guillotine. What is less publicized is the estimated 200,000 people that revolutionary governments massacred between 1793 and 1796 in just a single region of the country. The Vendée was an uprising of a region with its own power centers, its own religious preferences, and its own designs on the country's resources and priorities. It was mercilessly crushed in the name of establishing a more unified and powerful French Republic. It's hard not to see the echoes of this in the supposed counter-terror wars of Africa's Sahel region in recent decades. Absolutely, religion is a factor, as it was for the Catholic peasants rebelling against the French Revolution. But more than that, I suspect these insurgencies are about ethnicity, language, and resentment against the elites who govern from capital cities, who are, in many cases, consolidating their power over these distant provinces for the first time. Picking and empowering elites to commit nation-founding horrors is not a game that the United States should be playing. No outside power should be doing this. The perniciousness of outside meddling was actually a big part of the horror of the Vendée, too. Without the war France was fighting against its neighbors at the time, the Vendée wouldn't have been anywhere near as bad. Most modern nations have crimes like the Vendée at their founding. It takes a deeper thinker than myself to say whether or not they are necessary. But if the United States is doing no good in the region, as has been conclusively demonstrated for like a decade now, then what's the point of associating ourselves with these horrific crimes of national formation? And make no mistake, if we pick the strongmen, train the strongmen, and arm the strongmen, we are complicit. We need to get out. Now. But what about Rwanda, you may be asking? For almost three decades now, interventionists, especially those who want to intervene in Africa, have been telling themselves and everybody else that the Rwanda genocide happened because the U.S. wasn't there. Doesn't the U.S. military presence make genocide less likely? Well, as I laid out at length a couple years back, the standard story of the Rwanda genocide leaves out a lot. If you don't mind, I'm going to just repeat my five-minute clip from back then. It's long, but I think it does a pretty good job of laying out the information, and it's really relevant to this topic. I've been meaning to talk about Rwanda for a while. The standard version of the story is laid out in Samantha Power's Problem from Hell, an account I read to prepare for this video. Power's chapter on Rwanda movingly tells the story of the horrific 1994 genocide in which Rwanda's Hutu majority murdered an estimated 800,000 Tutsi people. Samantha Power's tremendously influential take is that this horrific crime could have been stopped if only some wealthy, more militarily capable outsider had gotten involved. That's the standard story that Stavridis probably believes as well. 
The problem with this account is it leaves out the fact that if it weren't for actions by the French government, the genocide probably would have been much smaller. In fact, it's possible that there wouldn't have been a genocide at all. Rwanda's genocide was made immeasurably worse by a rich world intervention, not by a lack of such an intervention. This probably isn't something you've heard before, so I think it makes sense to talk about my sources. Uh, Samantha Power's chapter on Rwanda is 60 pages long, and it barely mentions France. It's mostly about the US government lack of response and the PTSD of the Canadian general on the ground. She barely mentions France, but importantly, it doesn't contradict the story I'm telling here at all. She just sort of doesn't mention it. There's a paragraph out of 60 pages on the French intervention uh, at the end of the genocide, and there's literally just one sentence that points out that the French were the main patrons of the genocidal government in Rwanda. But that's not something she wants to talk about. Um, Martin Meredith's account is only 39 pages long, but it provides infinitely more context on what actually happened in Rwanda. Martin Meredith's Fate of Africa documents how France armed and propped up the genocidal government in the years leading up to 1994, helping it fend off an invasion of Tutsi rebels. The Rwandan government's soon-to-be genocidal military apparatus was largely created and funded by the French. With French assistance, Habyarimana set in motion a huge expansion of Rwanda's armed forces. From the time of the invasion, the army grew from a force of 9,000 men in October 1990 to 28,000 in 1991. France provided training staff, counterinsurgency experts, and huge quantities of weapons. It financed, armed, and trained a presidential guard, an elite force recruited exclusively from Habyarimana's home district. It also facilitated arms contracts with Egypt and South Africa. An estimated $100 million was spent on arms supplies a vast sum for a tiny, impoverished country. Much of the money came from international funds, quick dispersing loans under a structural adjustment program intended for economic development. Now, of course, the French government didn't want a genocide to happen. Just like the Obama administration featuring Samantha Power didn't want to steal a decade of economic development from some of the world's poorest countries in North Africa and the Sahel by destroying Libya in 2011. But the lack of bad intentions does not excuse these incredibly irresponsible actions. After the genocide started, the French did intervene and they may have stopped the slaughter in a few places. But the main effect was to help their clients, the Hutu Genocidaire government, escape to the Congo, where Rwandan spillover helped tip that unhappy country over into a war that killed something like six million people. That's something that enlightened foreign intervention has a disturbing habit of doing turning crimes against humanity into holocausts. Not so fast, Rob, you may be thinking. What we've got going here is sort of a classic uh, she said, he said situation. Uh, Samantha Power is a widely respected stateswoman and the uh, newly appointed head of the US Foreign Aid Agency in the Biden administration. And who's this Martin Meredith character anyway? Some curmudgeonly British journalist? Maybe he's making stuff up because he hates the French. Well, uh, in 2021, uh, Meredith's account was confirmed in large part by the French government. This is the second French government inquiry into its role in Rwanda. In 1998, four years after the genocide, a French parliamentary investigation found that French behavior in Rwanda had been exemplary or even heroic. But 27 years have passed now. Francois Mitterrand, the French president in 1994, has been dead for a quarter century. The presidential report released this year confirms the grim version of events laid out by that British journalist. While it's careful to point out that France didn't want a genocide, it concedes France's heavy and damning responsibilities. So yeah, please stop using the Rwandan genocide as a justification for rich world military intervention. In fact, it's the strongest argument possible against outside military intervention. 
For years now, I have feared that the lack of scrutiny of U.S. actions in Africa has been hiding Rwanda or French Revolution-style crimes. My suspicion was that we weren't really fighting Islamic terrorists. We were fighting the peoples of these various countries, and the jihadist insurgencies were just an after-effect of that choice. But I never had proof, so I couldn't run with it. Well, I'm putting this video out now because I have had most of my fears completely confirmed by some truly horrifying reporting that Reuters put out in December. In 2015, the crimes of Boko Haram, a northern Nigerian insurgency, became international news. Specifically, their mass kidnappings of young women. The international cry of bring back our girls led to an outpouring of U.S. military support. All the massive human rights concerns about the Nigerian military were shoved aside. This was, of course, helped by the fact that, unlike most countries in the Sahel, the Nigerian oil industry means that U.S. defense contractors can get rich off selling stuff to Nigeria. The U.S. State Department has published a selected list of some of these interactions. We have contributed tens of millions of dollars to the training of Nigeria's military, and we have sold them billions of dollars worth of equipment. Among the items we have provided are attack helicopters, armored personnel carriers, and a couple of 400-foot Coast Guard ships that we apparently mostly just donated to them. It's important to note that this equipment isn't just being used to fight Boko Haram. There are many other insurgencies in Nigeria that have nothing to do with transnational jihadism. These fights break down along ethnic lines, economic lines. I, I believe farmers versus herders is a big thing. I don't know, maybe Nigeria needs to have some of these fights to better establish itself as a country. But I do know that the United States should not be arming up the Nigerian military to make these fights more violent. And it's now horrifyingly clear that that is exactly what U.S. support is doing. It's not ending any of these conflicts. It's making them more horrific. The December Reuters reports document a systematic program of forced abortions for women recovered from insurgents. It also documents a program of mass slaughter of children who might be associated with insurgents. Reuters documents the murders of 60 children in depth, but believes that the Nigerian military may have slaughtered thousands more. To be clear, we're not talking about teen soldiers here who regrettably were killed in battle. No, we are talking about children being physically ripped away from their mothers and murdered in front of them. We are talking about piles of dead children paid for by the United States. These Reuters reports are harrowing reading. Uh, they are, of course, linked in the description. Now, I would be very surprised if U.S. troops were involved directly in any of these crimes. But I think it's very likely that U.S. intelligence helped these child murder squads draw up their lists of villages to target. And it's clearly documented that the United States government provides heavy financial support and significant surplus equipment to the Nigerian military, sometimes paid for, sometimes more or less for free. It's now clear to me that what the U.S. government and their stenographers at the Wall Street Journal and The Economist are doing with all their jihad in Africa talk is providing a flimsy justification to profit off of more fundamental and deep-seated sorts of conflicts. These horrifying reports from Nigeria are probably just the tip of the iceberg. Our military first approach to these conflicts is almost certainly making them more intense and violent. An African military is much less likely to negotiate if the United States keeps handing them free ships and vehicles. Nobody really knows what the United States is doing in Africa. But we do know enough to know that we should not be there. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. And have I mentioned recently that I have an email list? If I lose access to any of these platforms, it will be the only way for me to reach my audience. Please do sign up either at the link here or the link in the video description. Thanks.